In this video, I'm going to introduce to you what I do and use to make my math videos. All this information is either from my trial and error, or actually, believe it or not, suggestions from my students. And because we all have different preferences, I don't think that there's any right way to make the videos, of course, so I'll explain what I found just works best for myself. With that said, I hope you can grab some ideas out of this, and it's not just a waste of your time listening to me ramble on. And because technology is always improving, if you have any ideas for me that you recently realized, please, please, please leave those uh, as suggestions in the comment section below, and I'd love to check them out. Now when I finally decided that I wanted to do all this for sure, I thought it would be really awesome to make the videos attractive, they'd include all these fancy transitions, different visual effects, music, etc. But I was thinking, do my students really care about all this? Uh, I didn't know, so I did a poll everywhere, uh, and this is a little clip that basically demos what happened back then. So after a bunch of suggestions, some serious and some not, I knew I had to make the videos a good quality. Uh, this was a must. The video had to be smooth, not choppy. The screen capture had to make the math work look very sharp, clear, and not blurry. These were a few things that I had to keep in mind, and really, I realized it just had to be like a high-definition video, really. So this is what I based all my judgments on. So here are the things I needed to figure out. These are the four components that I realized were a must for me. Number one, I needed something to record my voice and my work with. Number two, I needed some sort of pen or inking device that I could write with. Number three, I needed some sort of software that allowed me to do all the math on, and I kind of think of this as like my digital paper. And number four, I needed to figure out how to upload the videos to the internet. So let's check out the first component, which is the software or the app that I needed to record my screen with. And as I looked into this part of my video project, I realized that it actually might be the most important of the four components because if the recording was choppy or blurry, the students might have a hard time following along and then they might not like it as much. So first I tried to run a Google search of free screen capturing software and I downloaded a bunch of them, tried them out, tested them, but I couldn't find one that produced videos that really uh, flowed smoothly the way I knew the students would like it. But eventually I found a company called TechSmith that offered software called Snagit. Check it out. It's on TechSmith.com. Now the real nice thing about TechSmith is that it offers a lot of trials for the product. So you could always just give it a shot first and see if you really like it or not. Now it's not free, but the nice thing is that it does have an educator's discount that brings it down to about 30 bucks. However, trust me, definitely well worth it. Now before I get into some quick details, there's a part of the website that offers some really awesome to the point tutorial videos. And in that section, there's a summary of Snagit in video form. It's really good, so I want you to check it out. When's the last time you were on the receiving end of an email like this? Wouldn't you rather have this? You're ready to add your attachment. Click or on Or what's it. more effective, giving feedback like this? Or like this? See it, please start with your introduction. There are hundreds of reasons to use Snagit, but time savings and effective communication are a couple of examples. The next time you find yourself using a ton of words or are worried you could be misinterpreted, try using Snagit to show exactly what you mean. First, choose whether you want to capture an image or record a video. Then click the big red button See the crosshairs? Use them to highlight and select what you need to show. For a video, simply narrate your actions on the screen. You've instantly become way more clear. For images, add stamps, text, whatever. You can save your captures to your computer or use a share tab. It's the fastest way to use Snagit with the other tools you use every day. Snagit makes effective communication fast and easy. Now if you want to get fancy, the upgrade to this is called Camtasia. It's by TechSmith as well, but this actually allows you to edit your audio and video, and that's the fancy part. It's actually what I'm using right now, along with PowerPoint. And you can cut, paste, rearrange audio and video clips really easily. And although it's small, you might be able to see that towards the bottom of the screen right here. Um, the ease at which you can do all this is probably my favorite thing about Camtasia, although it does have a lot of other very practical and useful tools you can use. You can add pictures or videos of various tracks, um, and I think they call that layering is the technical term for it. Uh, you can even focus on things like this or 
even zoom in on different parts like this. And a bonus feature is bringing in a live webcam feed, but I think that that just gets in the way of like any problems that you're doing and actually causes a distraction. However, I'm sure that there's got to be a creative way that you could use it and make it actually practical. Um, now, this probably seems complicated. I get that. But TechSmith, their website, does a really good job with tutorial videos, and uh, you should really take advantage of that to allow you to uh, get the use of all the different features they, they offer. Um, now, the negative about this is the cost. It is a $179, and that's with the educator's discount. Um, there is a free trial that you could use and check it out and explore all the different features to see if you think it would be worth it, but remember Snagit still does all the basic things that you'd really need to do in this situation. The second component I needed was the hardware or the actual pen I needed to write with. You might think, well, why not just use some sort of tablet like the iPad or Windows Surface? Well, it's because I haven't found an app that screen captures your own screen without restrictions like the TechSmith products can. The apps that I've tested either only allow me to record a part of the screen, which is usually too small for a lot of the math problems, or I could only use the writing tools built into that particular app, which always seem to be limited, unlike the Microsoft OneNote, which is what I like to use. So I had to find something that runs Windows or the Mac operating system. I looked into the Windows Surface, but unfortunately you can't always install software, like from TechSmith, onto the Windows Surface RT. It doesn't work. You have to uh, upgrade to the Surface Pro that has a full version of Windows, which is somewhere around $700. So to find hardware that has a full version of Windows or the Mac operating system, along with a pen with a smaller tip, like a tablet PC for example, it gets pretty pricey. So let's move on. I was left working with the digital pen that connects using USB or Wi-Fi to PC. It works with Macs too. Now, I swore to myself that this could never work for me, but I found a digital pen that works awesome. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. You write on a blank pad of some sort which controls the cursor on the computer screen, and that's it. It's challenging at first, I'll admit, but after using it a few times, it's really easy. It's kind of like learning how to type for the uh, first time the correct way. Challenging and annoying at first, but in due time, you can really type fast without staring at the key. So trust me, try it. If it doesn't work, well, you can leave a comment below criticizing me. So, um, now my recommendation is anything by Wacom. I use the Bamboo Splash, which I believe has recently been discontinued. And the new model is the Intuos Pen. for $79. Now, it may look smaller, and that's because it is. The actual surface in which you write is about like five by six inches, but somehow it just works. So pick it up, try it out. If it's not for you, just return it. Um, I like it because the tip of the pen is very small, so you could easily write in small parts of your screen, unlike uh, the uh, traditional thicker tip uh, stylus that makes it so difficult, in my opinion, to add small details to the screen without zooming in. Um, it's also pressure sensitive, so if you press hard, the ink gets darker, and if you press lightly, it gets kind of thinned out. So, I highly recommend anything by Wacom. Great stuff. Now on to the third component, and it's what I like to call the digital paper. Now this part is truly your preference because there are so many different directions you could go with it. However, these are the things that I had to consider. Uh, the number of colors I got, the thickness of my pens, and then also the ease to which I could access those pens during the video. I had to make sure I had access to tons of colors because the students said it pops more and it sticks out, and I agree. Only having access to common colors like black, red, and green are rather limiting in my opinion. Uh, I also had to pay attention to the pen size, which is basically how thin or thick the inking is. And if it was too thin, I realized it was just too hard to see on smaller screens like phones. And if it was too thick, it was just too difficult for me to write small in between different parts of the problems. Uh, actually, having the variation of those is a huge plus because writing with different sized pens, different thicknesses, can make parts of the problem stick out, which is great. So someone directed me to Microsoft OneNote, and I realized that it had all of that and then some. I could create a list of my favorite pens of various sizes and colors, and then that list had big icons that I could click during my videos. Uh, these were my musts, and OneNote had it all. Uh, here are a few other things that I thought were really useful. Um, the type of eraser could be modified. Uh, you could erase entire strokes or just specific parts. You could even change the size of the eraser. 
Uh, there is also a tool you can use to circle a part of what you wrote and then delete it. Or even before deleting, you could move it to another part of your screen. Now, say if you had to move something but were starting to run out of room, you could actually insert more space using the Insert tool. Uh, you could also add more space below whatever you were doing uh, using the small arrow down below. Um, zoom out if you wanted to to see the entire canvas. Uh, speaking of canvas, you could change it. You can make it a grid paper uh, and of various sizes. You could even change it to line paper if you'd like. Um, there are a few other tools like adding text at different areas of your canvas. Uh, it even has the equation editors for math teachers if you need that. Add in arrows or coordinate systems, stuff like that. You can capture pictures from worksheets and then paste them on your canvas. You could even insert entire Word files or PDFs and draw all over them or ink on them. Uh, you could jump from notebook to notebook on top of the uh, OneNote screen and those notebooks can have each of their individual tabs on the right side here. Uh, it's truly just like a notebook really. The tabs are very nice for videos with multiple problems because you could jump from tab to tab and each tab will have a new problem on it or one tab might have a formula that you might want to skip to but I think you get the point. Uh, I'll stop and uh, move on to the next thing. Now after I found something to write with, which was Wacom Pen, on my digital paper, which is OneNote, while recording my work using TechSmith products, I need to upload my video and YouTube works great for this, but you'll need to create a free Gmail account to do this. One reason to use YouTube right off the bat is because TechSmith has a shortcut on Snagit and Camtasia so that when you're done recording, you could upload directly to YouTube. And it only really takes one or two clicks because it saves your account information onto the software. So it's very convenient. Now, when your video gets to YouTube, you've got three options. You could make a video public for all of YouTube to see. You can make it private so no one can see it at all in case you're not done editing it. Uh, and you could also make it unlisted, which means that someone could only see it if they have the link for that specific video. I usually try to take advantage of the unlisted feature so that only my students can click the links to the videos and then I can grab data from that, but uh oh, there's that word data, right? Well, this is usable data. I mean, there are so many professions out there where you could find data that supports whatever argument you're trying to make, right? I'm usually skeptical. Then there's always predictable data, like with math. Uh, if you've taught topics in the past, you know exactly what part of the unit that your students are going to struggle with, right? It's just a hard concept, so every group of students that come in, they'll probably struggle with that. Um, you don't need data to tell you that, that's just experience. Well, here's a feature that allows us to get detailed, honest data that might not be so predictable. If you use Google Analytics, you can see all this. Now, lots of people look at the views, but really, someone could just click that over and over again, which would give you a false idea of how many times your students are actually using that video. I like to look at the minutes watched. So since I know that only my students can see the videos, I know exactly how long they've watched each video. I talked about honest data and predictable data too. Well, here's an example to show you what I mean. Uh, last year, I taught the law of signs. Eventually, the students took a test on it, Data show that they did pretty good on it, but when I checked the stats on Google Analytics, it showed that the videos covering uh, examples on Law of Signs actually had the most minutes watched. 
So students obviously need some extra help, right? They definitely weren't going home and watching the videos just for the heck of it. Um, also, I couldn't predict this because the data that came from the test showed that the majority of the students were getting these problems right. So that's why I called honest data. Hmm, honest data. Maybe I should do a research paper about that or something. Anyways, what happens when a few years go by and multiple classes watch the videos? How do I know the difference between this year's stats and last year's class's stats? Well, you could actually pull data from a range. So uh, the week before a test, I could look and see what videos people are watching. And maybe that will give me an idea of what I truly need to reteach, um, or at least just an extra idea. It's not like the students are going home and watching stuff they already know. And again, that goes back to that honest data, if that even makes any sense. Another way I realized that I could use Google Analytics is during that week before finals. Because normally I'm like, where in the world do I start reviews, right? We've just covered so much throughout the semester. Well, I realized that I could watch the stats of the videos if I wanted to and see which videos were being watched the most. So that's just another idea. But now off to write that research paper on data, right? Man, more crickets. Okay, so that's about all I've got. Again, this is just my opinion based on my own experiences. There's so much technology being released every day, as we all know, so by the time I actually produce this, I'm sure that there's some new stuff that has already come out and makes me look especially dumb. So, with all that said, good luck on your adventures. Please comment below if you have any recommendations, feedback, or criticisms. And that's all. Take care.